locked in a little bit. Well, um, I'm not sure how much poetry I'm actually going to do today. Because today on our schedule, it says that I'm talking about the American spirit. And actually, that was originally titled the African-American spirit. And then I asked Steve, can you take the African part off? He said, sure. So that gets us today to the American spirit. Um, and a little bit about what I think is significant for this year is um, it is 2008, and we are still sort of in the midst of a long time sort of historical event. And that's in um, 1808, where the U.S. decided to join other leading countries and abolish the international slave trade. So that was an abolishment of the actual trafficking of Africans from the continent. So it was the beginning for the United States to step into uh, making some different decisions about human rights and social justice and equality. Um, the year before that, in 1807, Great Britain actually led the way in saying, okay, this is enough. So this year, um, here in our country, it's, it's a time to reflect on that. And last year, I was a part of a sort of countywide, which is not just county, but international movement to celebrate the abolishment, the 200 years since the abolishment of the transatlantic slave trade. And as part of that, I put together um, a collaborative project which um, took poetry. I wrote um, a set of poems, haiku poems about the Middle Passage which is the, the part of the trip that um, vessels took from Great Britain, England, to Africa, and then to what we know as the New World, Caribbean islands, the Americas, and things like that, and traded um, human people, human cargo, Africans, for other goods, and that was part of the international slave trade. So I, said, I wrote a set of haiku about that, and last year set about um, looking for artists, that would be visual artists and musicians to come together. And what they did was they interpreted the haiku. And we had an opening of that event here in Grand Rapids last September. And right now, today is the last day that exhibit is um, actually in its last day at Holy Family University in Philadelphia. And then hopefully it will be coming back to Muskegon. So it's a traveling, traveling exhibit, and I'm going to show a video that um, Steve Warner, who works for the um, Community Media Center, he put together about, um, actually he worked with some high school students about that exhibit. So we're going to watch that first, and then I'll get back to talking about the, um, the American spirit here. So now I want the video to play. See we will. need perspective when we look at our past, and we just make so much more of it. I mean, every second of every day when we participate in the world around us, we're creating history. I mean, we have so much of it to examine and look at, and trying to capture pieces of it through a creative process, I think is the challenge. significance of the Middle Passage is the most heinous time in African American history, I think. These families, villages, nations were ripped apart. Um, people were brought over here to do free labor. And uh, it was just probably the worst time, um, like a Holocaust for us. But out of all that came survivors. And that's probably the best thing, because uh, those people who made it through the Middle Passage uh, those uh, small percentages of the, the general uh, populations of, that came were, uh, were survivors. I mean, we survived the worst part of the beatings and drowning and, and um, babies being thrown overboard and all that. And so the people who were left here, people who were here to start uh, this new country, um, were the strongest of the strong, the fittest of the fit, and we are all descendants from those people. So. For me, that is the biggest significance of the Middle Passage, that um, out of that came the strong survivors that, that make this country as great as it is today. The Middle Passage, um, to me, is a celebrated jailbreak from the wells inside. Sinkays come pouring. 
when we look at the issue of slavery. Europe makes one side, Africa held the other, red as El Agua. But nunca a madre snaps los next Free waters cannot give up free people calmly without making waves. Waters cannot give up free people calmly without making waves. Free waters cannot give up free people. Free waters cannot give up free people. Free cannot give up free Free waters cannot give up free people. Without making waves. Free waters cannot give up free people. Free waters without making waves. Without making waves. Free waters. Free waters cannot give up free people calmly. Free waters cannot give up free people calmly without making waves. Free waters cannot give up free people calmly without making waves. Locked in a little bit. Well, um, I'm not sure how much poetry I'm actually going to do today. Because today on our schedule, it says that I'm talking about the American spirit. And actually, that was originally titled the African-American spirit. And then I asked Steve, can you take the African part off? He said, sure. So that get, gets us today to the American spirit. Um, and... A little bit about what I think is significant for this year is um, it is 2008, and we are still sort of in the midst of a long time sort of historical event, and that's in um, 1808, where the U.S. decided to join other leading countries and abolish the international slave trade. So that was an abolishment of the actual trafficking of Africans from the continent. So it was the beginning for the United States to step into uh, making some different decisions 
about human rights and social justice and equality. Um, the year before that, in 1807, Great Britain actually led the way in saying, okay, this is enough. So this year, um, here in our country, it's, it's a time to reflect on that. And last year, I was a part of a sort of countywide, which is not just county, but international movement to celebrate the abolishment, the 200 years since the abolishment of the transatlantic slave trade. And as part of that, I put together um, a collaborative project which um, took poetry. I wrote um, a set of poems, haiku poems about the Middle Passage, which is the, the part of the trip that um, vessels took from Great Britain, England, to Africa, and then to what we know as the New World, Caribbean islands, the Americas, and things like that, and traded um, human people, human cargo, Africans for other goods, and that was part of the international slave trade. So I said I wrote a set of haiku about that, and last year said about um, looking for artists that would be visual artists and musicians to come together. And what they did was they interpreted the haiku, and we had an opening of that event here in Grand Rapids last September. And right now, today is the last day that exhibit is um, actually in its last day at Holy Family University in Philadelphia. And then hopefully it will be coming back to Muskegon. So it's a traveling, traveling exhibit, and I'm going to show a video that um, Steve Warner, who works for the um, Community Media Center, he put together about, um, actually he worked with some high school students about that exhibit. So we're going to watch that first, and then I'll get back to talking about the, um, the American spirit here. So now I want the video to play. See if it we will. need perspective when we look at our past, and we just make so much more of it. I mean, every second of every day when we participate in the world around us, we're creating history. I mean, we have so much of it to aid. But I wanted to partner with other artists because thinking about trying to talk about that kind of period, period in our history, our meaning American history, um, I didn't think the poems could do it all by themselves. So I sent out a blind email to a whole bunch of art schools all over the country and people either going to say, hey, this is interesting, or they're going to ignore me. And what we have in the room now is what happened from me sending out, I couldn't tell you, 100, 200 blind emails saying, this is what I'm trying to do. And these are the artists who responded. I started in slave ships. The significance of the Middle Passage is the most heinous time in African American history, I think. Because Families, villages, nations were ripped apart. Um, people were brought over here to do free labor. And uh, it was just probably the worst time, um, like a Holocaust for us. But out of all that came survivors. And that's probably the best thing, because um, those people who made it through the Middle Passage, uh, those uh, small percentages of the, the general uh, populations of the came were the survivors. I mean, we survived the worst part of the beatings and drowning and, and um, babies being thrown overboard and all that. And so the people who were left here, people who were here to start uh, this new country, um, were the strongest of the strong, the fittest of the fit, and we are all descendants from those people. So for me, that is the biggest significance of the Middle Passage, that um, out of that came the strong survivors that, that make this country as great as it is today. I got involved in the Haiku Middle Passage Project because I was involved with the whole um, celebration for the abolition of slavery project that took place in 2007. It's a, uh, a chance to um, um, collaborate with another artist, poets, musicians, and other artists to come up with a, a collective uh, thought about this whole uh, Middle Passage. Um, my work was based on one of the um, haikus, and I entitled my work Captives. I took, um, I, I love Romare Bearden, he's my favorite artist, so I took the collage medium and used that as my medium. Um, it is a, 
uh, medium which has glued pieces of paper and images to, to combine to make one image. And what I did with mine was I thought about the middle passage, thought about the uh, verse that I had, and uh, the whole idea of, of, of captives was, was captivating. I mean, it really did um, make me think more about the people on that ship coming across. Um, if you look at my piece, you'll see that it has not only um, uh, slaves all crammed onto the boat, which was one of that is that one image that you always see of the slave ship. And I use that repeatedly in my uh, image that uh, uh, the quote unquote loose pack versus tight pack uh, for the cargo. And uh, I kind of expanded on that because I wanted to pack this little boat with um, as many people or entities as I could get. But if you look very close, you'll see that there's Dr. King in there and, and there's uh, Muslim brothers and uh, there's a lot of different uh, people other than just the slaves that you normally see, the figures that you normally see. Haiku number 14 by artist George Bayard has captives, closeness swells, you reflects, pray, God sees, you know not what you do. With this piece, I picked out the pieces of Martin Luther King Jr. mixed in with the Middle Passage pieces, right along with protesters and other things. And then I see that it's a ship, but it's in a sea of sorrow and crying. The little things I picked out, and it's like hands are pulling them in. And it seems like they're going to a place and they're, you know, the journey is still going. So am I right about the you no, know, we should, you know, we should overcome. Am I right about the things that I deciphered out of the picture? Do you believe that's right? Well, we we have to remember that the piece really depends on what you bring to it, and I agree. So I think you're right because I agree with a lot of things that you're saying. There's so much going on in this piece by George Bayer, who is right here from Grand Rapids. So. He has a, a gallery down on um, Wealthy. I know him too. Yes, you, this is a hometown person. Yes, because yes. he does our artwork in our house. Um, <laughs> so in this piece, there's a lot going on. You have to look really close. And the first time I saw it, I didn't see everything that's going on. I just, it's, it's busy, and it's a lot of stuff happening. And in that period of time, a lot of stuff was happening. Like, what really drew me in when I first, when I actually figured out this is a child. This is a baby crying, and I don't know if it's whether the weight of this whole experience is crushing down on that child. And then you have all these other faces in here of kids looking off in at something, and they, you know, they look afraid to me. And then around the, the, we have this. Actually, what it looks like to me, woo, what it looks like <laughs> to me, is that um, the way people were housed in the uh, yeah, the belly of the ship. And then we have the civil rights movement, like you said. Oh, right here, you look really, really closely. That's an auction block. That's a, a woman, looks like a woman, and I, don't, I can't tell. But they're being auctioned off there. And then we have people up here that's in the ship. It is so much. Um, I expanded that on the outside of the frame by, by cramming them into the matting around the frame. And um, I, I, that whole idea of this being crammed into this little space uh, was, was intriguing to me. But um, I, I left a, a message of hope in it. Um, a part of my passage uh, um, says that God sees, uh, sees the, the slave ship, and um, he sees the slaves, and he sees the, the, the slave owners. And um, you know, judgment awaits both. So, um, so I had uh, the hands coming from the sky are kind of like angels. Uh, uh, Giving the, the the slaves a a, a hope, a, you know, a hope that um, even if you make it, um, you, you're going to make it, and even if you don't make it, you're going to make it. So uh, that was another part. And then there's other little hidden messages in there. I mean, we shall overcome message, and there's um, babies in the water. You didn't have to look real good. And, um, but there's there's other little messages in the in the in the object. But I really liked it, and I thought it it, uh, it went well with the passage that I had. And uh, it makes you think. It really does make you think.
the, the fact is we have more past than we have future. Future hasn't happened yet. We can speculate on it. And, but most people, you don't hear people talk about, I want to make future. They want to make history. In the sea of sorrow, I call it, um, we shall overcome. It, it still states that, this, that we, have, we have not overcame. So do you think that as youth my age and we're the generation to come after you guys are gone, with the people left, do you think there is any way that we can overcome the odds and be successful? Um, that's an easy yes, because the struggle that youth are having today is not new. It just happens to be theirs. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's the same struggle I had. And when I, I just think when we think about a we, in, there's a lot of issues that are going on with young people today that understanding your past, and maybe the his, your history is not 200 years ago. Maybe your history is just 20 years ago or whatever um, challenges your family may have had. But if you can understand that, if you can accept some of the issues that may have happened in your past are impacting your life right now. Because that's really what this exhibit is about. The past, how does it impact where we are right now? And if we never think about that, we're not giving us ourselves the chance. Whether you're a young person or an older person, you're not giving yourself the chance to, to overcome. So we had to try to make those connections to yesterday, today, and tomorrow. And so we can envision a different tomorrow. Now I'm thinking, I'm not sure when you say when we're gone, we don't want to wait to people like myself when we're gone. Because what can we learn from each other right now? Sure. And it's and we can learn a lot from each other. Me and Ario, we technically do not understand this piece at all. It's a lot of chaos going on here. It's some ribbons and the Holy Bible and suitcase and luggage. It's a lot of things going on. So um, we wanted you to explain to us what you got out of this and who sing K. Did you ever watch the Amistad, the movie? You've heard of the Amistad, the movie? Okay, well. Sinke, and that's just one of the various ways to spell his name. Sinke was a captive from Sierra Leone. Amistad, the movie, is based on a, the slave revolt, and um, he was the leader of the revolt on the slave ship. And sometimes when people tell the story, they think it's about um, slaves saying, we don't want to go and be slaves, but actually the fact of the story is that they didn't know what was happening. They just, they knew they were caught up in something and they were, you know, being treated really badly. But what actually made them revolt was the cook on the ship told them that they were going to be food. And when they said that they were going to be food, they was going to cook them up. That was the last thing that actually made them revolt because they, that was a horrific way to end one's life. So they actually revolted and then they they killed the cook. <laughs> Of the first person they got rid of, <laughs> and then they also um, killed the um, the navigator, then the, the guy who sold the boat. But they kept two people alive because they wanted to get back home. So the people they kept alive would steer them one way in the morning, and then the night they would steer them back the other way. So this really poem, poem is a celebration of the people with Sinke who who fought for their freedom, no matter what. I don't care if they're gonna cook you, they're gonna make you a slave, whatever you want to have some control over your life. But it also um, echoes the story of Jonah and the well. My name is Ross Baba Aaron Ibn Bori Fitz. And I've been involved in art for over 45 years. I principally work in printmaking, painting, and installation sculpture. Also film and videography. At the present, this piece here deals with one of the poems, one of the poems, Haku's A Celebrated Jailbreak from the Wells Inside, Sinke's Come Porn. And what it's about is it turns from the inside, as the print is expressing, from the inside of this blackness comes these, these, these Africans. These Africans represent Sinke. 
and they are coming from the well inside in terms of this universe, this ominous black light, which brings forth all light, all colors. And we come pouring out of this well's inside in terms of righteously writing the world. Uh, Ibn, when Ibn and I collaborated on, on the piece, uh, we had, we thought about it and we thought about all of the um, things that, that went on in the past as far as, you know, the middle passes, slave revolts, uh, slave ships actually sinking with full cargoes in, in hurricanes and things like that. And I, I also, uh, as far as a painter, thought about other artists that had made uh, kind of a homage to C.K., uh, people like Romare Bearden and Hale Woodruff. When you look at the inside of it, the inside of this is in terms of the raffia, the art, the wood blocks, children's blocks, the buttons, found objects. The suitcase was a found object. The Bible was a found object. Things that we throw away. But those things that you throw away can be utilized. And we feel that the suitcase ties in. Specifically, uh, we have a lot of things that we developed in here as far as uh, some of the icons on the front. And we cut these out, we developed them specifically. This is one of the third eye symbols. And, and we have some other totem symbols that go around. And also, uh, we decided to put the Bible in because uh, a lot of people in, that, that ran the slave trade, they used to go and, and pray in church and things of that nature. And, and that had a lot to do with the trade. And that had a lot to do with what they said that they were just doing God's work and things like that. The suitcase, we painted on the suitcase. We did symbolism in the suitcase in terms of the Veve signs, the secret society sign, the language of a people in terms that we were writers, we were storytellers. All of that has meaning. And my idea for the suitcase was actually that uh, slaves, are, we still, we're still traveling and we still have our bags and we haven't unpacked our bags. We, we've unpacked them to an extent but I think we're still in exile from somewhere. I'm, I'm not sure where, but this is, this is part of well, how I feel about it. And so this is a process of us going back into the suitcase, coming out of the suitcase, liberating ourselves. We liberate ourselves by researching and we liberate ourselves by collaborating with each other. Our lives are usually altered by something that's already happened, not something that's going to happen. So we should probably spend some time examining and reflecting on those actions and events that came before us. Roots, if some people watch Roots, I think everybody should watch that series and I think everybody should read the book because I read the book and it's so much interesting because you get the experience of someone like us born in this country to go back and look. And so in the book, Roots, it's all from Alex Haley's perspective. And you really get to say, wow, this is sort of my story too. Because in the movie, we get to see the other people's perspective. From the book, you get Alex Haley's. But one of the key things that I picked up, in, even from the movie, was that the people, um, the slaves where Kunta Kinte came, he was such an odd thing to them because they had not seen an African that fresh. He was a very late African being introduced to this idea of slavery. So he kept a lot of, and he was you know, a teenager, so he kept a lot of his information from home. And I, when I saw the movie, I just thought it was weird that they were just so, I'm like, don't they see this all the time? But the truth of the matter is, no, he was one of those Africans who came very late. And he wasn't broken. Most, my that, I mean, most, of Africans, by that time they reached a place where they would be serving most of their lives as slaves, they were already broken. They were already, their mind, their spirit, they were already, they had stopped off and they had places where they would condition people to be slaves. And he wasn't. So that's why it was so hard for him to actually be his devil to have to chop his foot off because he's like, I don't know how to do this because he didn't, he didn't have that stop along the middle passage to actually get him ready and condition him. Your name is Toby. I want to hear you say it. Your name is Toby. You're going to learn to say your name. Let me hear you say it. What's your name? Kunta. Kunta Kinte. What 
What's your name? Toby. Hi. Say it again. Say it louder so they all can hear you. What's your name? Toby. My name is Toby. Aye. That's a good nigger. Thank you, Professor Muhammad, on taking us around on the tour of the Haiku Middle Passage. Channel Zero, I'm Ariel Tay Gordon. And I'm Soda Smith. Thank you for turning in. See you next time. That was, as I said, a piece is put together for um, a project um, that the community media center um, uses youth, and they go into the community and they they make news. Um, so that's to give us. I I think that was a little more interesting than um, just starting with me talking. Stop that. But the idea behind my talk today, the African-American spirit, the American spirit, I realized um, pretty soon that I didn't have um, Steve take enough off of the title and just sort of unwrap it and get down to the spirit of the things. Because that's really where we start. Everything else, we sort of wrap it up um, and package it. But if we can unravel it and think about what it means to be human and what does it mean to embody a spirit and then figure out what we want to do with it. I think if we could shake loose a lot of the labels, and I have to tell you, really, personally, I, I don't like to use hyphenated labels um, because it's just, I mean, they're useful for some things, but just the, the way my mind actually works, they're not all that useful. They tend to separate people and have us think a lot more limit. They, they limit us. Um, and sometimes we need to do that. But if we are aware that at the root of what it means to be human is to have a spirit, and that spirit needs to be moved to do something, whatever the problem or the issue may be at the time, so, for example, when I first wrote the haiku, whoa, I'm getting older every year, a long time ago, um, I did it. I, I couldn't tell you exactly why. It was a challenge. It was a personal challenge to me. And that's why I set on the way of doing this. But when I got done, I'm like, well, that's it. I did it. And it doesn't mean much unless I can get other people involved and some other voices. So they sort of just sat dormant. And in the video that Steve Warner and the students put together that you watched today, one of the things that it says is that the exhibit, um, and you saw pieces of it, is um, a homage to one of the most brutal incidents in our history. That never entered my mind <laughs> when I did this. Because, I mean, history happens. And it, I mean, yeah, sure, it wasn't great, but for some reason, that process needed to happen to get us wherever we are right now, just like all the other things in history. So I don't really like to think about the collection of poems in the exhibit as to remind of all this bad stuff that happened a long time ago. So that's why I like um, Mr. Bayer's response when he says, you know, at the end of this, we had people and we had a spirit that could carry on and then keep creating what we need, which is a civilization. So we, yes, we have to work our ways out of a lot of the boxes we put ourselves in. Um, and when I think about what it means to have a spirit, I don't know, I was writing notes. So um, I'm thinking about is when you feel like you're caught up in something. And that's what it means to sort of shed all those other labels and just be one with 
the people that we are, the human beings that we have to be, you're caught up in something, and we have to figure out how to negotiate it and where we're going to go, how we're going to make something different in the world. Um, oh, I like the fact that I call Kunta Kinte a fresh African. He was fresh. Um, <laughs> he didn't know any of this. Um, but when you, when you know that this, oh, for example, my mom used to tell me that there's no such thing as common sense. It does not exist. Because what's common to you will not be common to someone else. Now, she says everybody has sense, but it's not necessarily common. But we like to think that what our, our perspective is the perspective that everyone has. Um, so that's sort of like thinking about the idea of there's not the African-American spirit. There's not the American spirit. Um, but there's a world, and there are people, and there are injustices that are continuing to happen to this day. We have enslavement rampant on our planet. It just may not be where you can see it right here, um, where you can visibly see it, but it's still here in our country. Um, and we have modern-day abolitionists still fighting against that. So that spirit that we see and that they talked about in the video and that's embodied in the poems, and I guess one of the more popular poems is that free waters cannot give up free people without making waves. And that's sort of, if you think about that, it makes sense. We can't decide that um, our version of the truth is always going to be what's going to be the right version. How do I do this? I want to close it. Um, one of the things I want to share with you, because one of the students early on in the video talked about critical thinking. And I think feeling and understanding what it means to be human and embody that the spirit of humanity is about thinking critically. Now, just like having sense, most likely, even if it's not the sense of my neighbor, I know, and you, my neighbor probably knows when something isn't right. It's just not right. And what do we do? Do we try to just close our eyes and make it feel right? Maybe it'll go away. Um, but in that sort of idea about what do we do and what kind of sense is out there amongst everyone, in that way, it is common. Because we can always know when something is just not right, we may not have the words for it. We may not be able to articulate it. But I think our first response is to try to do something to make it right again. Um, so in this, um, thinking about what it is to embody a human spirit and have some sense, put the sense to the best use as you possibly can. And I'll quote my mom all the time because she's old, she knows stuff. <laughs> she has 13 kids, she knows way more than I do. Um, but you have to take the time to think. So even though my mom raised 13 kids for the most part on her own, she never apologized. My mother never, ever, ever, ever apologized for, you know, well, kid number seven's sucky childhood. <laughs> but she acknowledges that it could have been better. But she says you have to understand. Like me, I'm number 12. So the other 11, they think number 12 and 13, that's my younger brother, we had it really good because she was older when she had us. And that's the truth. And she didn't apologize for that. But she said, hey, you have to understand, when I was 19, I had the mind of a 19-year-old with a baby. When I was 40, I had the mind of a 40-year-old with a baby. So I was different people. I can't apologize that, oh, you didn't get all the attention that you wanted because I can't go back and change that, but I can acknowledge. And that's all we can do is make decisions within the space and the, and the knowledge that we have. Now, we don't ever collaborate, talk to other people. We're sort of boxing ourselves in to sort of repeatedly not do better in our decision making. Um, but we, if we acknowledge this, there's room for improvement and that our perspective is not the only perspective that thinking critically sometimes means just taking time. And as a student said in the video, thinking critically is like thinking deeper. 
sometimes take an opportunity. So I'm going to share a little exercise with you about criti thinking critically. So I'm going to pass this out. It's a photo. I'll just sit there for you. Like that. Thank you. It's a picture. It's a picture that my daughter drew when she was in second grade. So I use it in class for my critical thinking assignment and what it means to take some time out and consider who we are, where we are, and where we are capable of going. So I think almost everybody has one. So if you look at the front page, this is this little girl. So when your when you're six, seven-year-old comes on and gives you this, you say, oh, that's so nice. It's pretty cute. Um, so I asked her, well, what is she doing? How come you didn't draw the whole face? She said, well, mom, she's playing hide and seek. So she's in front of a, she's sitting next to a wall, so you can't see her whole face. OK, that's nice. Go away. So she goes away. And then if you turn the picture over, what do you see? Yeah, so I had to call the little girl back. Come here. OK, I understand you had our time. You drew the picture. Um, that's nice. But why did you draw the back of her head? And what did my daughter tell me? You can figure this out. It's about perspective. It's about knowing what you already know, even if you don't acknowledge you know it. It's critical thinking. She said, Mom, it's there. Why would you not draw it? If there's a, then she became the, if there's a front of the face mother, obviously there's a backside. And then she walked away happy. And I'm like, wow, that's critical thinking. That's what, that's what we need to do when we are trying to quiet our spirit and figure out what to do. And is it the African-American spirit? Is it the American spirit? No, dummy. It's just the spirit. And then you have to figure out what context and what you want to do with it, with the situation that you happen to be in. So that's my, you can take these and share the critical thinking story. It's very helpful. Um, but it's the obvious. So um, I'm going to ask from the video, are there any questions that you want to ask me about the project? Or I am going to share some poetry. Um, because that's the fun part of what I get to do. And did the person come to fix it? You Two, heard? yeah. Oh, cool. So, but I need to know if you can remove your jump drive. Oh, that's what I have to do? Yeah, because we have to put that back in, I think. Oh. If you are going to ask a question, let me know so I can get a microphone to you. So that obviously we don't need it for the size of the audience, but because we're trying to capture what we're doing here today. So if you could let me know if you have a question, I will uh, bring the microphone to you. Except for him. I know you're not done, Morsalata, but I want to tell you that um, I thought, I think that what you've done with the haiku and your work with the commemoration of the ending of the slave trade was the best work that anybody on that project did and I've seen it all so um, I want to congratulate you personally and I want to tell you how thankful I am that you work at the same institution and share the same space that I do um, I think you're wonderful um, beyond that I want you to tell everybody where they can get the haiku Middle Passage, where can, if, if they want a copy of it, where can they pick it up? Oh, do you mean just the, the... Your poems. The poems? Yeah. Actually, nowhere right now. I haven't collected them. <laughs> we need to do that. Yes, we need to do that. But um, you can visit the Haiku Middle Passage blah, blog spot that's out there because that's going to follow the exhibit as it goes around and um, as it travels. The And the idea, just go back to that, is we are... Um, three exhibits now and 197 to go. I don't know. Why do I? Because if you don't dream big, you got to dream small, and it's not fun. So um, we want to have the exhibit go to 200 places. And after it, you know, when I'm 87 and it's at its 200th place, all the pieces will be um, auctioned off. And so every part of the um, 
exhibit is trying to em embody that whole experience. So all the pieces will be auctioned off to whoever the highest bidder, just like in you know, history. Um, and then the proceeds will go to some sort of charities, which I haven't. None of this has actually worked out. This is all dreams. Um, but that's, that's the goal. So um, when I do get the site up in, if you can tell people about the blog spot, the, the more people talk about it, because the only way the exhibit can travel is if people talk about it. Like when they went to Philadelphia, um, they, they had just a wonderful time. And I got um, information from other places where they think it should go. Nobody's giving me any money to send it there, but that's okay. I'm getting places for where it should go, and people are talking about it. So no, but I, I, I need to collect the haiku. And one of the reasons I haven't collected the haiku yet, and this might sound weird, weird because since I'm a poet, I just, I like, I want it to be alive, and it's in a little book, it's on a page, and that's kind of just not as fun to me. And there's some poems that I think are fine on the page, but there's some that I think you need to be able to grab you. So I don't know if that means I gotta make a CD. Like in the video, you heard all the people reading it, and I usually do that as an exercise, and people really like that part of it, that interactive piece. So, um, but other than that, since what I do is poetry, I'll share some of my other pieces of poem with you that I that I like. History poems. Um, this is a poem about a potato. And I'll read that to you, and then we can talk about it. So now we're in the poetry hour. I am root. Growing wild, waiting, deep in Andean plateau, mountainous regions, Peru. Unbeckoning with no luscious fruit, grain, berry to pluck. No sweet scents, tempting salivations, readying to devour my flesh. I am root, waiting. In times that knew no record, just truth, waiting for pre-Incas to discover Tributes to my presence, thriving where maize y trigo wither, I am root. With eyes everywhere, noting ink and cultivations, allowing my sprouts to grab tighter this earth, I am root. Eyeing civilized keepers of days who entangle me in war. 1537, no one shouted, aquí, aquí estoy conquistadores, come, find me. Yank me, pack me away with other found items, gold, art, people, proofs that there is a new world closer to heaven, further from Europe. My 17th century roots, my truth buried in God's earth, food to the masses, my skins pale to brown, delivered them when they were tribal, German, British, Persian, Hanoverian, against Austrian, French, Russian, Saxon, Swedish, Spanish. Seven years entangled in each other's lust, I sustain Anton August Permitil well in Germany's belly. He took it upon himself to reintroduce me to France, where the dish bears his name, you taste my flesh. Failing to murder each other, I am the root you forced to center spot, renaming this ethnic conflict the Potato War. You raid your enemies' food supply where I lie, only me you consume in hopes of eating them to death while they do the same to you. Forget I feed everyone or no one. I am root, sustaining friend and foe, Brenton through Napoleon, World War I, two, Feeding five times that of wheat, of me you write, propagate a murderer, a participant in genocide. I killed a million Irish, more, me, not British imperialism. I like history. <laughs> so did I get any of that right, history professor? Okay, because that was a lot of work. Um, so yeah, I, I spend a lot of, I do a lot of research those seven years in grad school, no, 
Didn't finish the dissertation, but I, I know all about the potato. It is, it, and it is it's so interesting because there actually was a war called the Potato War. Because they, were, they couldn't beat each other. So they're like, okay, we'll raid each other's food supply. And then maybe we can starve them to death. But they both had the idea. Hence, then that common sense were shared on both sides. So um, I like this. I also like it. Um, I also like um, Irish history, too, because um, learning about Irish history is actually how I understood race relations in America and for myself. And that's a good feat, considering that I was born and raised Nation of Islam, black, we're better than anybody else kind of ideology. So, and I understood that ideology too after going to college and having to take Irish, well, actually British literature, but taking British literature and then learning about the Irish situation, um, I, I began to understand if you have um, people, and the same thing um, on the continent of Africa happened with, between Europeans. If you have people practicing, um, genocidal tendencies against people who look just like them is like a bonus to find people who don't look like you because you don't have to work as hard to say why they're different. It was hard when the people looked like you, but now it's like, wow, we got you look different. You don't know our religion. This is just great. This is what we were waiting for. Um, I like, I'm from Detroit, so <laughs> I actually do like my city, despite the poem I'm going to read to you. <laughs> I love it. So next to Grand Rapids. I have two hometowns now. I don't have a Grand Rapids poem yet, so I guess I'll be 100% at home when you see something like this. It has Grand Rapids at the top of it. All right. Detroit. Like most overpeopled places, I'm a toilet. I stand before you with no facade. I ain't got no identity hangups. My north side harbors once upon a gangsters left with only grandiose stories of Negro heydays of singing and dancing and pushing and pimping. They ain't got nothing on east side young blooded killers who don't know their fates, so they still say what's up and play ball with you. My south side should have a neon sign. Welcome to wet back Hispanic Latino land, where, on, where the only thing separating them from the hood is a maybe Spanish accent. Bowtied FOI accosts you on the west side with fruit, bean pies, Muhammad speaks, enough Malcolm X impersonation to remind one what they used to be. All over I breed, People who've foregone living any American greeting card lines, opting to hone skills that make survival a most profitable commodity. Women who don't love and those that do until it breaks noses, detaches retinas, kicks fetuses from wombs. Crime that's 100% equal opportunity, accompanied by unsexist police ass kickings. That said, Give me my props. I once had paradise in an alley. Now I've got Joe Lewis's fist hovering above the spot white men meet. That's my Detroit. There was, mm -hmm. FOI is the um, fruit of Islam. And they're the, the young men you usually see selling the goods on the streets. Um, and actually, there was um, the Fruit of Islam was like the young people organization. There's for women and men, but the men were the only ones you saw selling the Muhammad speaks out in the streets. Is that a big in it used to be, not really. I mean, I think we we have um, FOI. I forget on which side of town here that they sell the Muhammad speaks still, but and in Detroit they're still usually in one spot, which is on Davison. That's where. <laughs> You, okay. Yep. So we have a spot. They have a spot still in Detroit too. Like my poem. You ready, y'all? Go down to Detroit and hang out. Um, but this was this was my Detroit before casinos. Now I have. 
Can it get worse? Yes. Open two casinos downtown and one across the water if you want to see it get worse. I'm going to try to find something happy. Oh. Or something fun. How about that? This is fun. This is called hips. Man, they so smooth. Pendulums everywhere imitate that motion. Girl, like a seesaw in steady, constant momentum. Holding in life for dear life till every, till the very last moment. When hips let go, nobody better block this way. Cause I ain't coming back if they come my way. Um. I may have told people about this last year. I have not um, moved on my newest project. If I told you about it last year, I'm exactly where I was then. So um, I decided uh, a couple years ago that I know I don't have enough to do, so I'm going to write poems for the bus boycott. I'm going to write one poem for every day. So that means 381 days of walking. I think I have three poems. So, one, two, three, hey, I have four. Um, but what I realized for, um, to, to sort of finish this is I have to go places. So I have to go places and be in that space um, to actually sort of complete it. Um, but what I learned so far about that um, bus boycott was that before it actually started and who actually carried it out, it was the women's group. So they basically um, made that effort happen because they had all the connections in the community. They knew where everyone was. So when it was time to go, the women went out. And that's why it's important that women talk and go to the hair salon and call each other up on the phone because, um, well, throughout history, you see how women, women aren't usually paid that much attention to. So in times of war and crisis and get things done and who's gonna get this stuff over there, we use women or they would use children um, to get those things done. So that happened during the um, bus boycott that most of the women who were domestics, um, they had access to the church more so than the men, um, and printing presses because of the church. They had to print out the you know church program every week. So I, that's sort of the part that I learned um, in doing some of my research about the bus boycott and trying to think of what am I going to come up with and do. Um, I think I want to share some, and and my poems aren't all. They they're pretty much come from whatever is out there in the ether that I happen to grab down. Um, like if I share these set of poems, I wanted to do poems on some occasions that everybody think they sort of they knew. So like the wedding, it's fun. That's a, this is actually okay one. I want to do one that's not so fun. Oh, yeah, let's do adultery. Um, and I did, just so you know, I did do wedding first because there's no point. You can't do adultery unless you have a wedding. So a wedding came first, and then I thought, what's going to shake up the marriage? Well, this little thing might. Um, <laughs> the complete unplannedness of it all made you decadent made me forget rules, regulations that now I wonder if God really made. It seems insane that he who loves so, who has left evidence of that passion everywhere we look, 
would forbid us from consummating how could he how could he forbid we who are created in the same spirit image of loving so from loving so it could have a different title but then where would the controversy be <laughs> then it would be all nice and stuff how come like wow Morsal is pretty dark the occasion lies sliding from tongues at first an unsure event phonetically small mere pieces of something bigger deeds miscarried sound grows into syllables dripping over lips unstoppable now spilling into ears until the bulk of words squeeze past truth and warmth of life, plopping into the world, modeless and rouge-tinged blob, shivers in each hearer's consciousness, waiting for unquestionable acceptance or discompassionate disgust. You can tell me if you don't like it too. So. You know, it's interesting, Ms. Bob, that you use the word love in that particular sentence. It is, you know, an implied lie. Mm hmm. I gotta go look at it. Oh, that's judgment. Why does this keep coming up? I didn't want that. Um, yes, it probably was intentional. Because in, in these poems, I spent a lot of time mulling over just trying to look at um, some things that we might think we know about and then just trying to magnify them and amplify them, give them a different perspective than we had before. I think it takes a lot of effort to lie. I mean, it's a, if you want to do it well, and people are usually after something or trying to defend something or hide something. So I think it takes a lot of effort. And that's not to say that I don't lie, but when I get caught in lies, I pretty much surrender because it's just too much work. It's like, well, yeah, I lied because because if you do one, then you have to keep up with all of them, and then just get to be a really big mess. Um, so I don't do it very well. Um, the occasion, occasion is judgment. We glance swift as hawks, sighting the prey's neck, catching them not always, unexpectedly, but always certainly looking for someone else's actions to lay before our guillotine words, readying the flesh for such sharp self-righteousness that God shudders at our disremembrance of least ye be judged. It's something we do all the time. I think people do it. Read this again? Okay. We glance, swift as hawks, sighting the prey's neck, catching them not always unexpectedly, but always, certainly looking for someone else's actions to lay before our guillotine words, readying the flesh for such sharp self-righteousness that God shudders at our disremembrance of least ye be judged. Um, this poem reminds me of a time I was invited with some other poets to Washington for a poetry event. 
Um, so the people that I went to a retreat with and I work with, um, Ishmael Reed, he was the, he's my hero. Um, he writes any and everything. He's a cultural critic and all this kind of stuff. So one of the other participants invited us back to her university. It was not a good experience. I don't even remember what the university was. But I was extremely, extremely agitated and irritated because when they did the, the PR work um, for everyone, they listed me as Mursala, well, she listed me as Mursala to Muhammad, the Muslim poet. And that just, I didn't want to go. <laughs> I was like, I don't even want to show up because what are people, <laughs> I mean, and then I thought I can incorporate that into my act and I'll just show up and I don't know, in a stereotypical what I think people <laughs> would expect. So that's what this poem reminds me of. And I, I mean, and I called her and I talked to her and I thought we had a relationship and I could say I would prefer not to be labeled the Muslim poet. She's like, no, I can't do that. She said, because you are a Muslim. I'm like, yes, but that's not my poetry. So I still, I did, I wish, that's one thing I wish I, I wish I had not gone, but I went. Um, I really tried my hand in writing some love-like stuff because, <laughs> because this poet I know from Puerto Rico, I guess, you know, Puerto Rico is the island of love. She told um, me and the other poets from America, she's like, how come we come to this, um, we come together every week and none of you ever write about love? What's wrong with Americans? So there you go, there's my challenge. So I'm like, okay, next week I'm going to come with some love, lovey stuff. Because Americans love just, I mean, it's not all about, I guess, I mean, she wrote some really cool stuff about the avocado and stuff, but I was like, I don't know. But this was in my line of more salada, find a heart. <laughs> and I'm not quite sure if this found, but it might work. You tell me. Loved indigenously. I want to be loved indigenously. Come give me some of that reciprocity. I think that's the best way for you and me. Native respect given effortlessly, unspoken, just known, discarding all other roles. We curl into each other seeking to know the world, then break free, go about our duties, until time comes to fill out ourselves, my skin for you, your skin for me. I need to be loved indigenously, the kind nature gives, full of reciprocity. I have a heart. Um, this one is, I have some poems that I really just try to be quick and minimum. That's why I like poetry, because you can say a whole lot in a little bit of space, even though it may be torture getting to that little bitty compacted space. Um, and this one is called Prayer. I mark my body in no special ways, no oils, perfumes, not one ornament from the norm. Scrub until skin burns, cleanliness reddenly, reddening my epidermis. I know now when I pray, I go not to my God, but to my master, and do not wish to catch his fancy. There's a spirit there. Uh huh. That's. Um, no, I guess I'm thinking, and this probably was around the time that poem was around the time that I did uh, the um, haikus 
things like that. So, you know, here's a woman in a situation. So she does not attempt to make herself appealing. So I'm not blush. I'm not doing anything. I mark my body in no special ways. I'm not putting bangles on. I'm not doing anything. I'm trying to not be noticed in this situation. So whereas now, you know, if you want to be noticed, that's what you're going to do. You're going to mark your body. You're going to, whether that be some cultural markings, henna. Okay. So this is a person coming to terms with a situation in trying to live, to live within those constraints. Um, I'll share the one that um, I didn't want to show my mother because I thought she was going to be mad at me. And then it got published in a book. Then I knew it's like, oh my goodness, <laughs> she's going to be mad at me. So I kind of I went home and I took the book. I was like, Mom, I got a poem in this book. This is like, this yeah, I was since I've been here. I'm like, Mom, I'm publishing the book, so I'm trying to you know hype it up. Yes, you want to read it? And then I left and I called her. I'm like, Are you mad at me? <laughs> She's like, No, it's really good. I wonder who you're talking about in this poem. This is very autobiographical. <laughs> so I'm like, Oh, really? No, not you, not at all. Um, so, and it's one of the first pieces that I ever write, uh, that I've written. I don't have a lot of pieces of poem, poetry that actually, um, I sort of, my, my religious background and my family sort of in there, but this is like my one. So if you don't understand any of the words, I'll say, tell you, but last days of a slow cooker. And I was mad when I first started this poem, just so you know. You don't get this much background, but I was mad. I wasn't liking my family. They weren't acting right, but when can you get 13 people to act right? <laughs> Last days of a slow cooker. Issa brought 13 halal chickens to her house last night at 6.53 a.m. right after Fajr. She started getting the birds ready for slow cooking over her 50-gallon drum grill. It cost her $80. She still owes 22 Khadija for helping her buy it. She hasn't taken her medicine today. It makes her feel funny. She washes each piece, feeling the barely cool flesh in every section of her hand, except the fingertips of her left one an irritating reminder of her stroke last New Year's Eve. She pokes holes in the pieces so the herbs soak in to the bone. She places the bird into her special mixture, freshly mashed garlic plus garlic powder, small cut pieces of onion plus onion powder, curry, sage, lemon pepper, kosher salt, more garlic. By 10, she lights the coals, not too many, because she's slow cooking today. By 11, she and the coals are hot enough to begin grilling. She shifts back and forth from left foot to right foot in front of the grill. She is too heavy for her current health status. Lying each browned in herb section of bird neatly on wire racks, she looks sturdier than the back porch's dirty gray foundation sloping dangerously towards the ground on the right. It's a crooked house. Slowly, word of mouth walks, ride bikes, buses, cars, uses cell phones, carrying smells of her slow cooking across Detroit. By 1.30, they arrive wordless, except for maybe muffled salam alaikums. And one by one, pile food on the small green kitchen table. She knows who's been there by what they've left to be cooked. For baking, pineapples, Miriam. Yams, Mustafa. For frying, corn, Malik. Okra, Khadija. Squash, all colors, Elijah. For boiling, brown rice, Malika. More corn, Daoud. The steak is Rahman's. There's only two because he knows she doesn't like cooking beef, convinced mad cow disease is a plot to kill poor people, especially black ones. 
He leaves only enough for himself with a note. It's halal. She cooks it on a different grill. The mysterious, by 245, the mysterious appearance of food stops. After all, we do want to eat at some point today. The coals have reddened and their heat has risen almost as much as the pressure pumping her blood that continues to dumbfound Henry Ford Hospital's ER doctors who say, we don't know why your mother is still conscious and able to talk. Most people ain't slow cookers, one of us replies. The doctors don't get it. By 6.15, her dicing, chopping, slicing, cutting has brought by faces she hasn't seen in months, some years, all of them wanting to know, how you been? And commenting, you look good as it smell in here. By 7.30, the last of the slow cooked pieces of bird are like her, done. By 7.33, children, grandchildren, great grandchildren, expected great great grandchildren, friends and friends of friends descend like roaches on 254 Pilgrim Street wearing Muslim names like afterthoughts. No one notices she has no appetite. If she did, there isn't one thing on the menu a 74-year-old high blood pressure disease heart could safely ingest. By 9.15, she's dead, asleep, when latecomers struggle to rouse her asking, when you cooking again? She considers my offer to come live with me, but would rather a massive stroke make that decision or death null and void it completely. She answers, I don't know. When I get some rest, I guess. Okay, they say, see you next week. Oh, I'm at my time, I think, or a few minutes. So I guess I leave you with that piece. So you see why they want to show my mom that piece? <laughs> um, so I actually wrote this piece when I was away at a retreat in Florida, and I got a call that my mother had had a stroke. So that's why I wrote this piece, my gift to my brothers and sisters. I still haven't showed it to them, but my mom, she, she's understanding that way. She's like, no, it's good. I like it. Keep writing. So <laughs> are there any questions? Or hopefully the time you spent here today was worthwhile. Thank you. Are there any questions? <clears throat> Um, how many poems have you written so far? And I don't know if you know or not, but oh, you wrote so know. many. Um, these are some of them <laughs> you have up on the screen. Um, I really haven't written any lately. A lot of times I get overtaken by the, the need to write, so everything else has to sort of stop, and I'm glad that hasn't, that hasn't happened to me for a while. But um, I'm sort of like in a mostly work mode now. Um, and working with the, the Haiku Middle Passage. So I, I don't know, a bunch. I can't tell you how many <laughs> I actually have coined that no one's probably seen. Um, I found a poem I wrote in fourth grade to my dad, so that was fun. I was like, wow, that's really, really bad. <laughs> <laughs> when Can you write a poem if you decide, OK, I'm going to take this week and relax and write? Or does it just have to come to you regardless of you planning on it? Um, um, both those things. Like, I will see something like, I really want to write about this. Once, like for my friends, um, I wrote poems. I wrote a poem for my friend for her husband because she wanted to give him something. And I really like doing that. So I can write poems. Like, I, if I can come and talk to you and you tell me about someone, and I'll take all that information. That's really fun, and I'll make something, a poem for that individual. So that's fun. It's challenging, and you have to like it, too. So, And they know you didn't write it. They're like, I got this sort of written for you. Um, but the news, a lot of times, makes me write poems, poetry, and things like that. Um, where, where was your... Or did you have a time where you knew, like, this is what I want to do, I want to be a poet, or was it more of like a progression of things, I guess, um, maybe where your initial inspiration was? And a second question, I guess, um, what do you think of, uh, you know, poet, poetry today, 
um, in relation to pop culture? It's a show. Um, so for, well, I don't know. I, I think I, I've been writing for as long as I can remember. Because that grass, so education was important in my family. Um, not formal education, just you had to. You had to read books and you, you had to do that kind of thing. So I think writing is just sort of a natural deal for me. And it's like learning how to read. Once you learn how to read, um, who is my favorite? Um, Frederick Douglass and his book. And when he, um, his autobiographical work, he talks about when he learns how to read. At the point he learned how to read, he was incapable of being a slave anymore. It just was not possible. He, he just couldn't do it. And that's how free literacy is. So once you learn to read and you learn to write, if you watch any book about American slavery, or you watch any um, movie about American slavery, the one person who knows how to read, what they know they're not supposed to do. They're not supposed to do it, not supposed to teach anybody. What they do, they run around teaching everybody and getting in trouble because you just, you can't stop doing it. So I think um, having a literate um, citizen group of people is one of our responsibilities to make sure that we are literate and we challenge each other to, to do that. Um, the state of poetry today, I don't really know really what it is except for what's on TV and I don't think that's all that great. Um, I don't know, we have, it's not ever gonna die. You're not ever gonna get rich off of it. So I never went wrote poetry because that's why I have a job. <laughs> So um, it's not something, poets only get rich after they die. So that's and not a fun route to go in your career. I just want to know, what are your difficulties in writing? Do you experience any hardship in the process of your? Oh, in the process? Yeah. Yes, not being happy. Because um, when I had, I have a lot of versions of like I'll have six or seven or more versions of one piece, and knowing how to stop, knowing how to say, this is finished, um, and it's finished for now, and that's the hardest thing is to to put something down, um, and a lot of times to qu actually to quiet my mind, because I I have a habit of thinking a whole bunch, so try to quiet my mind enough. So I can, and, and instead of getting frustrated by, there's so much out there, there's so much to do. Because um, for, for me, that writing is a critical process. It's an opportunity to look at something and scrutinize it and take it apart and see if you can tell somebody something they already know in such a fresh way that they learn something new from it. So that's hard. Well, I want to take this opportunity on behalf of the Social Sciences Department and uh, Grand Rapids Community College as a whole to thank you for spending this time with us today, Mercilada. It's been very, very enjoyable. A great learning experience for all of us. Um, I am very proud to say that uh, Mercilada and I first met <laughs> when she was a graduate student at Penn State at a uh, convention, I guess it was, of uh, graduate students, and uh, I was a representative from GRCC that sort of coaxed her into perhaps submitting an application to the college, and she did, and uh, the rest, as they say, is history. Yes. So uh, I am very honored that you did decide to come and join us, and I echoed Mike Light's comments from earlier. I, I really agree that we have some wonderful, wonderful talent here not only in teaching, but in which is our primary focus, obviously, but in all these other things that, that you've uh, heard today and as well as other folks that have been here all week long. So thank you again. All right. Thanks. Thank you all. And if I could um, invite Mike up here, we wanted to do a little closing uh, session here for you today for a couple of minutes. And... Uh, one thing that I think we can take away from this today, though, is that we all have that spirit. And I was um, happy when Mercilada asked me to change the title of her talk. Um, and I don't like hyphenated words either. And so just to be in touch with your own spirit and, and 
uh, think about yourself and, and your role and in your world and the greater world and uh, your relationship to others and your family and friends and community at large. And and if you want to put thoughts down on paper or if you want to make that into music or if you want to draw a picture or if you want to tell a story to somebody, that's what arts and sciences is all about. That's what liberal arts is all about anyway, and that's what we believe. But um, I want to turn it over to you for a couple of minutes. And <laughs> Um, I'm not sure what I can add to that. I'll tell you all that um, we tried to, this is the second year we've tried to have a celebration that was lengthy and detailed that deals with African American history, with black history, but with history in general. And so what we tried to do this year was pretty ambitious, I think. We tried to weave a theme throughout um, all of these presentations that is exactly the heart of what uh, Morsalata hit on today, which is uh, this is about being a human being. I mean, we call this Black History Month, but in a way that's contrived that you would uh, sort of segregate the calendar the way we've segregated each other in the past uh, into these uh, one-month periods. You know, next month is Women's History Month, and, you know, so what about the rest of the year? I guess that belongs to white men. Um, so, you know, I, I, I love the fact that she made this about the human spirit, and if you've been to any of the other presentations this week, you've heard the same theme over and over and over again. There is only one human being, and that is all of you, regardless of color. Race is, is, a, is a construct. It's something that's created by human societies to justify exploitation and differences, and it's not a, a reality, and the uh, sooner more of us can realize that, the better off we'll all be. Um, so um, I applaud the efforts of all the people who have taken time out of their schedule to help us do this, and I thank all the students and the faculty and the staff that have come to see these, and hopefully if you haven't been to all of them, you'll get a chance to watch them again on the College Cable Channel or on YouTube. We'll put it out there. Um, so you can come back and take a look at all these again, and I'm sure you'll want to come back and visit these poems again. That was awesome today. Thanks. This is the website for the Haiku Middle Passage commemorative exhibit, and um, Mursalata, is there a, a link somewhere from the GRCC website, or... Great, thank you. As uh, Professor Light just mentioned, we had a lot of people participate, so I want to publicly thank Dr. Matthew Daly from Grand Valley, who was our keynote speaker, as well as uh, Professor Keith St. Clair, Mike DeVivo from our social sciences department, and also Bob Hendershot from the social, or social sciences department. We also had presentations by Dr. Daniel Lerner, who's our Associate Dean of Arts and Sciences, uh, Professor Cedric Williams, and uh, Dr. Burbridge, Gary Burbridge, who spoke earlier today on environmental equity. And so uh, we look forward to doing this again next year. We want to keep making this bigger and better, and hopefully uh, as it gets bigger and better, um, we can continue to try to destroy myths continue to try to teach each other about the human condition and about how we can all coexist in this world and make it a better place for everybody. Thank you all for being here. Good luck. <laughs>